I can show in your eyes. Make you wonder by wonder over other ways and under on a magic carpet ride. <laughs> okay, that's <laughs> enough of that. Welcome to Table Ready Gaming. I'm Dave, and I'm so glad that, that intro did not scare you away. Anyhow, on today's episode, I'm really excited to share this project with you because it's October. And that means that if you live in the United States, stores are starting to fill up with cheap Halloween decorations. And a bonus for every D&D crafter out there is that these decorations are very easy to turn into some pretty metal looking D&D terrain or tabletop wargaming terrain. And that is gonna be the theme of the videos for the rest of October on Table Ready Gaming, is how to keep some of these cheap uh, Halloween decorations and turn them into accessories for your tabletop game. Anyhow, for my upcoming game, I needed a creepy looking thing to put down in a dungeon. I thought since we're exploring this old tropical island with my party, that it would be fun to do some sort of like Lovecraftian inspired, uh, trying to some fish goddess. And I also decided to take a page of the monster manuals and take bleed a bloop and basically make her cousin or sister. Instead of doing the crawfish and lobster crawls for hands, I want to do it something a little bit more creepier and deeper. And nothing says creepy, deepy sea creature to me like an anglerfish. So that's what I did. I tried to turn this old Disney princess into some creepy fish monster. Let's head on down to the hobby bench and see how I did. So my first concern I had when building this model was this Aladdin figure was made of some pretty cheap bendy plastic. This wasn't to be unexpected. I spent a dollar on this thing, but still something that I needed to consider. Also, another thing I had to consider was that her joints bent and her outer clothing came off because apparently there's multiple outfits you can buy for Jasmine so you can mix and match and make your own Disney wardrobe. So to fix these two things, I took some super glue, applied them to her joints to stiffen them up. I then cut her hands and spun them around as I felt having her palms up gave her a much more spiritual pose. Sure, the sculpting isn't perfect, but I think having the arms that are slightly unnatural bend to them kind of adds to the creepiness factor. Part of me even wishes I simply switched the hands so the left hand was on the right and the right hand was vice versa. And permanent glued on her outerwear. I also popped the head off because I want to save that for a future terrain project. Now it was time to work on her new head. This head came from one of these little finger monsters I found. Again, this part is made from extremely cheap, extremely bendy plastic. So I started by removing the monster's arms and cutting down its neck body. I then test fitted it onto Jasmine's body. Overall, I think at this point the statue looked more goofy than creepy, but let's press on. So I wanted the statue to have bulging eyes, kind of like my anglerfish inspiration. So I took my X-Acto blade and started carving out the existing eye sockets. This was very easy to do because the plastic was so soft and so bendy. I then replaced the monster's eyes with these steel ball bearings I found. I love these little ball bearings. They're great for making boils and pimples, and in this case, eyeballs. I wanted to reinforce the anglerfish look, so I used one of the monster's arms to add a head antenna on top of the creature's face. I glued another ball in there to act like the light. So I decided this monster needed like a really toothy looking grin. I did this by cutting down some old toothpicks and just kind of gluing them at angles in the mouth to make them sort of fit in there and I mean I don't think this creature could actually ever close its mouth but it definitely adds to the creepy factor. I then mixed up some milliput and I started trying to blend that uh, ball bearing into the creature to give it more of a uniformed look. So here's a little pro tip for you. When you're working with Milliput or any of these two-part epoxies, a glass surface is a great surface to work on. The putty doesn't really stick to it. So last month when this picture frame fell off the wall, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with it. I grabbed some duct tape, cleaned up the corner, and permanently glued the back on. Now I got a great work surface for my green stuff and sculpting projects. Hey, one of my hobby mottos is waste not, want not. So I took the rest of the Milliput and I filled a gap between her cape and her back. This isn't my cleanest work, but I think it adds to that rough stone sculpture look. I then got to work on the base of this model. The base of this model is very simple. I cut down some MDF bases I had laying around and kind of glued them to make the stair step approach. Then with a little sanding, I glued her on top and called this assembly done. So now that I'm a villain from a classic Pixar film, let's get some paint on this project. 
So I went and made sure the statue looked like it was carved out of some strange stone and dragged up from the bottom of the sea. My original plan was to spray the entire model with a lime green color, then wrap it in a used dryer sheet and spray a darker color over top of it. I've tested this method on spoons and the effect looks great. However, it seems to only work well on flat areas, so this would probably have worked better on the base. Unfortunately, I have already glued the model to the base. And while I could rip her off and start over, but I had a game on Saturday! I want to take a quick break from the video. I'd like to talk to you something that I think really helps hobbyists out, and that's deadlines. Now personally, I am a huge fan of just hobbying for the sake of hobbying, but sometimes you need that little extra kick to get a project done, and a deadline can be a great way to do this. Now the deadline doesn't have to be anything formal like you do at work, but it could be something as simple as a game you want to run on Saturday, an upcoming tournament you want to have your army fully painted for, or maybe even a painting competition you'd like to enter. Personally, I'm a big fan of Parkinson's Law, or the idea that work will expand to fill the time that it's given. That basically means if you're like, hey, I got all day to do this, you're not going to get it done. Now I understand when you're working at the last minute, sometimes you have to compromise quality and painting and stuff like that. But hey, time is one of the only resources that we have that's truly non-renewable. When you use it, it's gone. You're not going to get that hour back. So don't be afraid to hobby with purpose. I decided I was going for a speckled or splattered paint effect. I accomplished this look by first dipping the front of my airbrush into a glob of paint and then aiming that at the model and pulling the trigger. You can get a similar effect by loading up your paintbrush or a stiff brush and then holding it in front of your airbrush and spraying behind it and this will push paint from the brush onto the model. This is a great way to apply gore to the model by the way to get those blood splatters and blood streaks. Once that was done, I cut some foam and glued them to the base. I then stenciled in some simple flagstone patterns. While this isn't the best flagstone effect I could do, I really think it helps sell the alien look of the stone in the statue. I started trying to add a little bit more detail to this mini by painting the eyes and the head lantern silver. And then I was going to use Citadel gemstone paint on it. But in the end, I was moving too fast and I needed to wait for that paint, that silver paint to dry. I also toned the model down by adding some green washes. I then went for a wet stone look by applying gloss varnish to the entire statue. I wanted the statue to appear even more oceanic, so I made some seaweed by mixing Elmer's glue, green paint, and cotton, and then strung the seaweed all over the base of the statue and on her arms. Once that was done, the silver paint had dried and I went back to finish up the eyes. So here's some shots of the finished model. I think overall she came out okay. Solid 7 out of 10 on this project. I personally have a lot of fun kit bashing for my miniature hobby, especially when I'm able to use things that aren't intended to be used for D&D or tabletop terrain. In my craft, I have a motto, and that motto is, done is beautiful. And what I mean by this is sometimes it's better to just cross the finish line ungracefully than not at all. Sure, I could spend years trying to make this the perfect mini, or I could simply press on, finish the model, in the allotted time and learn new tricks for my next miniature project. I guess I prefer a finished project over a perfect project. Well, I hope you enjoyed this week's project. All of October, this is going to be kind of the theme for Table Ready Gaming. So if you haven't already, please subscribe. I want to show you how we can easily turn some Halloween decorations into easy tabletop accessories. Anyhow, I'm Dave. This is Table Ready Gaming. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next episode.